Good evening, this is your host, Dan Zapaski, for the program True Murder, the Most Shocking Killers in True Crime History, and the authors that have written about them. Ted Bundy was one of the most infamous, flamboyant American serial killers on record, and his story is a complex mix of psychopathology, criminal investigation, and the U.S. legal system. This in-depth coverage of Bundy's life and his killing spree that totaled dozens of victims is drawn from legal transcripts, correspondence, and interviews with detectives and prosecutors. Using these sources, new information on several murders is unveiled. The biography follows Bundy from his broken family background to his execution in the electric chair, The Bundy Murders, with my special guest, author Kevin Sullivan. Welcome to the program, and thank you for agreeing to this interview, Kevin Sullivan. Dan, Dan thank you so much for having me on. And, thank you. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you very much. This is a fascinating book that you have, uh, and, and about, a, again, like we said, one of the most infamous uh, serial killers of all time, notwithstanding. Now, the question I almost all ask exclusively of authors, uh, because I'm very curious, and I'm sure my audience is too, what made you decide to write another book about Ted Bundy? Like I said, one of the most infamous serial killers of all time. Well, uh, the interesting thing here is how I got involved with this. I never had any intention of writing the book about Bundy. Um, I started the Bundy book after finishing up another true crime book, but um, uh, I have a friend here in Louisville, and his name is uh, is uh, James Massey. He's retired now, but he spent 20 years in probation and parole here in Kentucky. And uh, I've known Jim for a number of years, and uh, during our friendship, he's mentioned several times that he is uh, good friends with Jerry Thompson. Jerry was the detective in Utah, who broke the case and kind of brought Ted Bundy out of the shadows when he was arrested in August of 1975. He was arrested right. on a burglary charge, a suspicion of burglary. Well, anyway, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we would talk about Jerry. But uh, I got a call from, uh, from uh, Jim one evening in, uh, in March of 2005. He said, in May, Jerry and his wife uh, will be coming to Louisville. Would you like to have dinner? Uh, you know, with us. And I said, sure, that would be great. But on the night that he uh, came to town and Jim called me, Jim said these words to me. He brought the bag. And I said, what bag? He said, the bag that Ted Bundy carried. I said, oh, wait a minute. I remember you telling me that Jerry Thompson had in his possession Bundy's murder kit. I said, oh. you know, you're telling me you've got the bag right now? He said, yeah, it's in my truck. So we were due to meet, like, I think it was like, Seven o'clock or six thirty up at uh, a local restaurant here in Louisville, in a, a steakhouse. I said, Jim, could you meet me a few minutes early? So I went up there, and lo and behold, there's this brown satchel with all the implements that Bundy used all the time to kill these women. And so we got to go over it. Well, Jerry was here for two days, and so we had a nice dinner. We went back to their hotel afterwards. We sat around the pool. Uh, I interviewed him about that. Uh, I talked to him about the bag. I knew it would make a good story for Snitch. Snitch was a local newspaper here in Kentucky that was in, well, it was actually in four or five states at one time. By 2005, it was running editions only in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky. So I interviewed Jerry. And um, uh, so during the two days that he was here, Jim was able to keep this bag at uh, at his home. So I called him one night and I said, could I bring the stuff to my house to photograph it? And he said, yes. So I picked it up from his house and I was driving through a darkened neighborhood, just as I can imagine Bundy did many years ago with this satchel on the seat beside me. And so I took it into my home and I had my wife clear everything off the dining room table. And so I was able to take photographs of all of these things. And it was the most surreal experience. And so... Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, I wrote an article for Snitch, but <clears throat> it was, but, I, and, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Before Jerry left town, he gave Jim, and he gave to me also, one of the green glad bags, actually yard trash bags, uh, that Bundy had in his murder kit. He had an open box of glad bags. He had already used some of them on, on victims, probably the Colorado victims, uh, so on and so forth, and maybe some Utah victims. But so 
when Thompson leaves town, here I've got this bag in my home. And, again, so surreal. I thought, you know, the interest in this case is just building and building and building. So after the article uh, was published in Snitch, you know, time went on, and I, I kept reading all of the books that had been published, and I thought, you know what, I think I'll write a book about Bundy. And so that's how all of this happened. But And w- what I'm about to say, we can get into it as, as it unfolds tonight, but <clears throat> the interesting thing was a lot of people were saying, you don't need to write another book about Ted Bundy. Right. He's been, he's been done to death. Sure. But something with him, he said, keep pushing. Let's just see what's here. I already knew that I had a pretty good knack for tracking people down and also, uh, you know, getting them to talk, and, and, and I was able to obtain research, and I was always really good at this sort of thing. So I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. Well, halfway through the book, I began discovering things that no other writers had, had, had found out about some of these murders. Some of these detectives were talking about things that would have been too sensitive at the time to release to anybody seeking this kind of delicate information. Also, some of, many of the books that were published about Bundy were published by people who knew him, uh, and they were published early, uh, most of them, like uh, uh, The Killer Next Door, uh, Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth, uh, the only living witness. Uh, those were all in the early 1980s, the very early 1980s. And so some of the books that aren't, uh, I don't think, as, as I- important Bundy books by some of the later, like the attorneys. Uh, I mean, they're good books, but there's been some that have been published, like uh, uh, from the uh, psychologists and stuff that have dealt with him on death row when he was wheeling and dealing and stuff like that. And, and those, I don't, are, I don't think, are considered uh, too much of, a, of, like, you know, full biographies, but dealing with Bundy uh, at that period in his life and his psychological. It, so, but, the, but, but, the full, but the major biographies of Bundy are pretty much early on. The only, and the only other folks who have written about Bundy that didn't know him uh, were Stephen Wynn, I mean, David Wynn and St- uh, Stephen Merrill. I hope I have that right. It's been a while since I looked. But they wrote uh, Ted Bundy, The Killer Next Door. And they were also very early. So outside of Wynn and Merrill, I'm the only person that ever wrote a book about Bundy who didn't uh, know him. Either. So you think that, so you think, sorry, you, sorry for interrupting. Oh, no. So you think there is some problems with Ann Rule knowing Bundy so intimately? I mean, most people know Bundy from. Well, a lot of people know Bundy from The Stranger Beside yeah. Me. And yeah. and so, obviously, and, and they know her relationship that she had with him. Uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, you do think sure. because she knew her, she knew Ted Bundy, that that made for less objectivity in her journalism? No, I, no, I see. Uh, uh, it's funny. People that knew Bundy, everybody's got a little bit different slant. Anne told her book, from the position of what she knew, and I think she did a fine job in doing it. Uh, people criticize her a lot for that book. Her book is not one of my favorites on Bundy, but but let's put it this way: I'd never get rid of mine. So I think she yeah. did a great job with it, and that's from her vantage point. If you take right. a guy like uh, Larson, who used to interview uh, Bundy when he was with the Republican Party in Washington State, uh, 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 What's his name? For Richard Larson, he worked for I think the Seattle Times. He had a really interesting uh, relationship with Bundy. And of course, once this came out, even though he felt like Bundy was guilty, he played friend to Bundy to get information from him. So he has a slant. And sure. of course, uh, the excellent book, uh, The Only Living Witness, and Confessions of a Killer, Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth had a very interesting uh, uh, a relationship with Bundy. They set out to quote, prove he was guilty. That's what they said. I mean, that's why Ted hired them. Of course, they knew Bundy was guilty, but in the process of all of this coming out, uh, I mean, they produced a couple good books. Now, Bundy confessed murders to them in the third person, so that was very good. That's a, the, right. All of these books are really great books. Now, Wynn and Merrill were just a couple good reporters, and they didn't know Bundy, but they did a good job with their books. So really, Wynn and Merrill and myself, you know, we're the two books that didn't know Ted, but what I found interesting, some of the stuff that was coming out when I did my research, for instance, uh, Lynette Culver out of Idaho, there's not a lot mentioned about that girl in most of the books. But I did a tremendous amount of research, and I went back to the uh, 
confessions of uh, Bundy that he made to the Idaho investigators. Uh, when uh, And so I was able to bring up new information there that's never before been in print. So all of these books have their really interesting takes on. My aim with my book, once I, every writer has a voice. And I knew that I could do good research and produce a good book. What I didn't know when I began was that I would turn up so many new things about the case of three or four of the murders, brand new information on them, and a lot of new things in a general sense about the case. And I believe I do a really good job of painting Bundy's decline, so to speak, from the really suave and articulate killer in Washington State of 1974 to the very sometimes grimy and inarticulate and and really mentally uh, 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 declining individual that he was in, in uh, Florida. There, there was such a vast difference between the Bundy of Washington State and the Bundy of Florida. It was the slow, the gradual meltdown from what he was there to what he became in Florida. And, and if you look at the two people, if you look at the Kyle Omega murders in Florida, and you're the detectives on the scene, even if you would have had a hint of Bundy and his murders in the Northwest, you'd have never put them together because the MOs were completely different. Yet Bundy was the killer, anyway. Right. Okay, well, let's go back to what you learned about uh, Ted Bundy. A lot of people, uh, there are some common facts about Ted Bundy. Uh, I don't know right. if you found anything to dispute the main ones, that he was raised by his grandparents, and uh, mm-hmm. they told him that his sister was, or pardon me, his mother was actually his sister, and he found out uh, much much later on that that was untrue. Right. Uh, you know, there is, um, I guess because he didn't bond with his father, there is always, and he never did know his biological father, uh, there is no. always that that psychological effect as well. What did you find right. that I think was surprising to you that, you, you, like you said, you did a lot of the research by reading all the other mm-hmm. available information. What did you mm-hmm. find out that was unique in your investigation of Ted Bundy? Well, the main thing about, for instance, the childhood, it's, it's apparent very early on that these were some uh, difficult things for a child uh, to have swirling around him as he grows up, to have his real father never to be there, to uh, 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 have an adoptive father that as he grew up he had problems with. It's true that he lived with his mother at her home with her parents, and so uh, there were uh, uh, there was, I'm sure, a lovingness to uh, the family towards him. Uh, Ted and uh, Louise were, were, were very much accepted there. There's talk of problems with the grandfather, uh, and some of it may be rumor, some may not be rumor, but you're right. He, he For a while he thought his mother was his sister, only later to find out that was his mother. Uh, as I mentioned to some other folks um, when they were doing uh, an interview of, of me, these things are hard on people uh, and on kids growing up, but there were problems beyond that which was happening uh, around Bundy because he showed signs of what uh, psychologists may call a fractured personality early on. His aunt said when he was three, she woke up one morning uh, to find uh, Theodore placing kitchen knives, pointing at her around her body. He had raised the cover, and he had pointed these things at her. So that, that speaks of some severe problems. Certainly. Uh, you know, that alone. And then something that I, and I think I mentioned this in the book, too, uh, could be the same aunt or another one, said that she was uh, waiting with Ted at a, uh, like a train station uh, at dusk. I, I think I put this in the book. I remember it from the research and uh, he seemed to kind of morph into another person, and, and, and that really bothered her. So for whatever reasons, he had psychological, uh, psychological problems early on. And where most people, as they grow up, they will adapt to being uh, adopted uh, and having a, maybe a parent leave them early to where they don't even have any memory of them. And, and they, they don't like it, but they adapt and they go on. Uh, he never could. He couldn't deal with it. He had a real sore spot. And in fact, when uh, one thing I came across, I cannot even 
say for sure whether this is mentioned. It may be mentioned in another book, but because I got so many things from the official record, I know that when Bundy was arrested in Utah and uh, they were doing psychological evaluations of him, and then and the court was also doing evaluations of him. I know uh, the, uh, proba- the 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 uh, probation parole officer who was writing about the case for the judge. Uh, he said that when uh, he when Bundy was asked about his uh, uh, his real father, that his face became reddened and contorted. And it was all he could do to, com- you know, maintain composure. But he pulled really? everything together, and then he said something I quoted in the book, something to the effect, well, you could say that uh, he left my mother and I and never returned. It wasn't exactly that. It's, it's in the book. But the fact that, that this rage came up within him, so, so much so, that he, his face reddened and it became contorted, gives you a good indication of what's floating around in this guy. So, you know, he yeah. he had his problems. And it could be that Theodore Bundy would have still become a very odd individual and maybe the same full-fledged killer, even if he would have had the most ideal surroundings as a child. So, hmm. well, We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you say that... Uh, you know that there were some problems at at home, and obviously the trauma of finding out that his, his sister is actually his mother and his grandparents. Yeah. And by this time, there was a stepfather that he really uh, didn't take a liking yeah. to. There was some major uh, yeah. resentment towards him. Now, mm-hmm. one of the I, I think again uh, the finding out about your mother is very traumatic, and and mm-hmm. you see that's oftentimes in some of these serial killers some of the same scenario. But then again, at the same time, there was so much stigmatization. Um, for an unwed mother, that there was some things done like this. So what, it was fairly more. It was a lot more common than, than you would ever see now. The other thing was yeah. that uh, Ted met a girl uh, that he thought that he thought was the perfect woman for him, and she was beautiful and highly sophisticated mm-hmm. woman. I guess Ted didn't mm-hmm. come from a, a super wealthy background as well, so I guess he admired people no. that achieved wealth and were successful. Right. So tell us a little bit about right. this this woman and and maybe you know because it really sets up the significance of of this woman right. uh, in his later life. Right. Well, uh, you touched on something very interesting. Bundy, uh, of course, was adopted by Johnny Bundy, and you know he was a cook at I think the Madigan Hospital, and you know he he and Louise, you know, they were good to the children, they loved all their kids, and they did what they could to to, to take care of them. But inside Bundy was a desire to have only the best of everything. And even from an early age, what he couldn't obtain through buying, through purchasing, which which really wasn't a lot, even from an early age, he learned to steal. And he had kind of a real contempt for anything that he would consider cheap or mediocre, uh, either be they inanimate objects or people. And so he kind of viewed Johnny as not being the swiftest, you know, mentally as as, as Ted grew up. He was, I, I'm, I'm sure, a smarter individual than Johnny. But, uh, you know, being smart doesn't always get you where you need to go. <laughs> it's not right. that it's yeah. that chamber. But, but, but the bottom line, he recognized yeah. the, the problems in Johnny Bundy. Now, this girl that he met, if you're speaking of uh, Diane Edwards, uh, she, right. she played she played a big part in his life. She was from San Francisco. I don't use her real name in the book. I'm just saying that's her name. And um, right. she she was a, a, a good-looking woman. I've seen a picture of her. And uh, other people have talked. I've talked to other people in Washington State and interviewed them who remember her. They said she was a really nice, nice-looking lady. And he was, um, you know, he, I don't know where Ted, when he was dating her, where he thought, all that was going because he had so many other problems and his fantasy life was building. But apparently, even even with Diane Edwards, he would take advantage of her. He would like use her credit card to buy things, and and uh, because of things that just I guess bothered her about Ted, and because of uh, uh, perhaps feeling like in the end he wasn't going to go anywhere, uh, they 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 had a breakup, and that breakup was exceedingly hurtful to Bundy, so much so that he told his cousin, and I, you know, I can't remember, I think this was like in 1960, 
nine. I'm not sure. You know, it's been, it's been several years since I've done the research and and you know um, you know written this. But I think it was like sixty nine. But he told his cousin. He said, "I've just got to get out of Seattle." And so he goes, it could have been 1968, and he goes back east to Philadelphia where he was as a child with the grandparents and his mother. And I say in the book, I said, you know, the flight to there, you know, like, you know, may have done some good, but surely the, he wasn't able to keep the memories at bay about what Diane Edwards had done to him. Well, Ted wasn't one to let things go, and so th- they would see each other periodically. And then later, and this is when he was uh, dating Liz Kendall, which Kendall is her uh, is the name she used in, for her book. Her real name is Clover, because I wanted to show respect to her. I used that name Kendall also, but uh, she, when Ted was with her, he kept her so sequestered from his political life when he was working in the Republican Party with people like Ross Davis so on and so forth. Ross told me he didn't even know about Liz, but he hmm. knew all about. Uh, Diane Edwards. Well, right. Well, to make a long story short, uh, just before his killing spree began in January of '74, he had gotten, you know, he had entered law school, and he had impressed Diane Edwards so much so that she recommitted herself to Ted, and they were due to get married. And this is the odd thing about it: once she said yes. She goes back to San Francisco. They're supposed to be preparing for their, you know, wedding whenever that was going to be set. And he had won in his own mind. He had gotten her back. It was payback. He never even called her again. And by the time she contacted him later on, and I think that was already in January, could have been late December, but I think it was already, already in January, uh, you know, he was well on his way into that other life of killing and he was passing from one realm to another where all uh, normal activity was being suspended for all this diabolical stuff. So, but he didn't care. That was a payback. But he, I believe Edwards had a very great effect on him early on when she dumped him the first time. Right. Yeah, that's an incredible story. And again, around at the same time, he finds out that his sister is actually his mother. So it's yes. a lot of traumatic yes. experiences all at once. Now, yeah. um, but he still was focused on his career, was politically involved. He was, he was a smart guy. Um, yes. He, he maintained uh, his composure in front of his friends, and, and, and a lot of people have mentioned his facade. So he, yeah. had, he had a character that he built. He was, he was a gregarious guy. He was an outgoing guy. Yeah. What, what happens yeah. next in Ted Bundy's life? Well, I, I should go back. As he grew up, he had a close circle of friends. He had uh, he had a friend Warren Dodge, and um, uh, I can't think of it offhand. Uh, there was another fellow that was a really good friend of his, and so they did things together. Um, I believe that that Ted wasn't a big dater, so much so in high school, and like uh, they remember that uh, th- there's a story this one fellow told. Uh, and it's in The Only Living Witness about how, you know, uh, somebody would come up to this fella and uh, uh, ask him to come to a party, uh, you know, at night. I mean, like, you know, over the weekend. But they wouldn't ask Ted, and you could see that that bothered him. So I I think Ted was considered somewhat of a loner. He was different. God knows he had his problems growing up because because Ted's personality was so fractured early on, and like I say, it might not be from everything that just happened to him. There could no one really knows why he became what he became. But as he grew up, he was able to mask a lot of things. But I think in my book, there's a big difference between like masking something, uh, masking uh, your inadequacies uh, in life. There's a big difference between trying to do that and then trying to hide your diabolical life of, of killing women. So as he grew up, he didn't know exactly, I'm sure, what to do with all of this. He's made statements like he didn't know exactly what it really meant to feel like a friend and have a friend. He, he knew his emotional state was different. But it was through the years that he was coming up and growing up. And uh, as I say in the book, 
as he developed uh, as a uh, um, you know young Republican, and uh, he was well liked. Uh, he was mentioned in, in the Seattle Times. Ross Davis, uh, who was uh, the head of the of uh, something out there uh, in the Republican Party, he uh, he you know he talked about how uh, doors were opening for Ted. I mean, everybody knew that this guy was going someplace. I mean, he had the out on the outside, he had the look of great success. But this is something that the reader, I, I, I tell the reader to keep in mind, that at the same time that the world was seeing all this, Ted Bundy was becoming prolific in his fantasy world, having to do with violence and murder with women. But all of that was inside. He could keep those fantasies inside. But he used to go out at night. He was a peeping Tom. And, you know, no, nobody really knows when Bundy started to kill. Now, his official launch into murder was January 1974. And there is a difference. No matter if he killed before then, there is a difference uh, in January of 1974 because that is the place where Bundy truly stepped out of one world and into another. From that point forward, his whole life was given over to only murder. Everything else beyond that was a facade, even his relationship with Liz. You know, he talked about maybe one day running for governor of, uh, you know, Washington State. He wanted to be a, an attorney. But by January of 74, he knew that he was just going to start killing women and keep killing women until he was caught. Until was either captured or killed, and, and 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 so his priorities became less and less as he got into those killing years in 1974, and he would start shirking his duties in the Republican Party because he couldn't be in two places at one time. But now there is there there there, is, there are reasons to believe that he may very well have killed in 1973. He may have even killed in 1969. I mentioned earlier about the psychologist books and people who dealt with him at the, like in, the, in, in his end years, where uh, a lot of researchers always go to those, but they might not, view, but they certainly don't uh, view those books as far as from the people I've talked to as being of the same as like doing a full biography uh, because of this reason. Um, towards the end, I believe sometimes uh, Bundy would, would make confessions to some folks that, that could be altered by him to help him gain more time because these people were hired by the defense. And so he told Dr. Art Norman just uh, a short time before he was killed uh, that uh, he killed two girls in New Jersey. Well, there are people that aren't so sure about that. He may have done that or he may have said that to, uh, you know, you know, give himself more time when he felt like he was running out of time with sure. all of the real cases. He, he, he was like Grant Straws at the end. So, so I, I, I don't know. I've got all of those books, by the way. They're very good. And like Ann Rule's book, I wouldn't be without them. They're in my collection, and they'll stay there because they're all great books. And but, 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 so, but some of these things where he speaks of earlier murders, they may or may not be. We just can't prove it. Even my book opens up with the killing, the the, the abduction and and murder of Anne Marie Burr. He may very well have been involved, in, you know, with that. And that was back in 1961. Bundy would have been 14, but we can't say for sure. He all but admitted it to uh, Ron Holmes, a criminologist here in Louisville, who had a lot of dealings with Bundy at the end. So it may be true. It may not be true. But one thing is certain. Once he crossed over into that realm of murder, full throttle, so to speak, in 1974 in Washington State, there was absolutely no turning back, and he knew that. And so everything else became a facade on the outside. And, and I, I kind of likened Bundy to a predatory shark, especially as he goes through the years. By the time he's in Florida, and we can get into this later, but he's like a predatory shark. I mean, the guy is cut off from his family. He's cut off from all his friends. He, he makes it to Tallahassee after escaping from Colorado the second time, and he made it. Comes through Louisville, you know, he, and, you know, he goes all he drives all the way down to, to he, he takes a plane out of, Chicago, out of a, at Colorado on his second escape, 
lands in Chicago. I mean, yeah, out of Colorado, lands in Chicago, takes a train to Ann Arbor, spends some time at the university there, steals a car, comes down through Louisville, dumps a car in Atlanta, takes a bus to Tallahassee. Nobody knows him down there. He could have maybe stayed down there for years, but after he was saved right. for a while, that, that desire to kill came back. But by the time he was in Florida, like I say, he was a different person. And he's a little more than a predatory shark. What's a shark do? They don't travel in packs. They travel alone mostly. I mean, great whites do. I'm, that's, what, you know, uh, that's what I'm told. And, and they just go out and they feed. That's all they do. This is what Bundy was doing with the murder. He just had to feed. He was cut off from all his friends, everything. So anyway, but... Uh, well, isn't that isn't isn't that a I mean I've seen that before where in less less so with the say Jeffrey Dahmer but a lot of these guys uh, as they descended to madness like you say he's isolated anyway he's he's uh, he's got nothing to lose and uh, and and so he he descends more into madness and the fantasy his murderous fantasy life takes over more isn't it. Isn't that sort of a symptom of what happens with these guys? They've got nothing to lose. 20 murders, 15, 20, 25, they're on the run. Yes, yes. Now, see, a sensible person, of course, killers aren't sensible. No. But a sensible person say, might say, well, look, I've made it to Tallahassee. Maybe I can lie low. Sure. Go to life for myself. But no, the whole reason that everything that's driving him is murder. Sure. And uh, the, the, I'll tell you another thing about Bundy. If you think about it, and I did this. Uh, during the uh, research period and the writing of the book. It's astounding the things that Bundy would do to abduct the person. Uh, you can, and I thought to myself, you know, if I was going to abduct somebody, I, I wouldn't do it in front of hundreds of people or thousands of people. I would mm -hmm. get somebody off by themselves, but Bundy didn't think that way. This is why <laughs> he became so confident in his killing spree in Washington State, that he did the double daylight abduction of two women from Lake Sam in July of that year, you know, uh, 1974. And uh, just think of that. He got one in the morning, took her to an isolated place. Some people think that he killed her, but he said later he admitted to William Hagmeyer that he kept her alive and that when he went back, and, of course, that was Janice Ott, and he got Denise Nasland that afternoon and took her back and then apparently killed one in front of the other. Then, of course, the other knows what's coming. It was all to create the utmost psychological terror sure. in the one witnessing it. And so, but see, that was an odd thing. He exposed himself. Now, that was a mistake because not only did he expose himself, but he used his real first name as Ted, sure. and, and, and it was overheard by other people. And one lady who went to his uh, car that day, and I have a picture in my book of his car sitting there under a tree that uh, someone had taken of a, uh, not meaning to take of his car, but take of uh, some police having to deal with some people near the parking lot. And uh, the police had told people at Lake Sam, please, please send in your photographs. We might be able to obtain a picture of this guy. Anyway, they did. So it's just everybody's confident. All the investigators are confident that's his car. And the lady that went with Bunny one day to his car to unload the sailboat, you know, that story, and, mm -hmm. uh, and she said, well, there's no sailboat on your car. He said, I mean, there's no trailer or sailboat. He said, well, it's at my parents' house up in, you know, Issaquah. And she said, I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to be my husband here. I can't go. He said, oh, that's okay. But she later identified his car as, as being at that spot. So he made some mistakes at Lake Sam. But even so, it didn't catch up with him until much later on. And uh, so anyway, uh, so that was an odd thing. Then, of course, when he went to um, Utah in, uh, uh, you know, September of 1974, he had uh, enrolled. He, he, he had gone a year uh, in, at, in, in Tacoma at, uh, at the, uh, I guess it was the Puget Sound Law School. It was a new law school at the time. He wasn't happy there, and he needed a new killing ground. So he left Liz there, and he went to Utah. Well, for the first uh, semester, uh, he killed. He only attended class three times that first semester. Really? He spent well. the rest of the time killing women. He killed at least four. And uh, one of the women, he, he, and of course, you know, he, he didn't have the supreme advantage of Washington State by knowing all the rural territory around, like, uh, sure. Seattle and all that stuff. Okay, so, so he had to learn that. He, he had been to Utah a number of times with Liz 
to see her parents. And as I say in the book, he he would scan that with a predatory eye. And of course, Lynn would, uh, I mean, Liz would not know anything about that. But he had to learn that territory. So he was an endless troller. So he learned the territory. But he, but in the in, in the period between when he got back. I think on September 18th or 20th, he had, he had moved, he had done the initial move in his Volkswagen on September 2nd, 1974, which was Memorial Day that year. Picked up a hitchhiker in Idaho, murdered her. That's another story that I brought to light uh, that's been kind of hidden in, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of some type of mystery. But I got the official record on it. I got what Bundy said about it. And uh, I was able to clear some things up with that. And uh, so anyway, and so he, he, he came to Utah, and then he had to go back to Washington State and uh, go back again with his brother Glenn in a truck, m- moved some stuff. Glenn flew, bla- fl- flew back to Seattle after he helped him with the move of the heavy stuff. And uh, somewhere around September 18th or September 20th, Bundy was back in Utah to stay in Salt Lake City. So between that time and November 8th, when he kidnapped uh, Debbie Kent from the Viewmont High School in Bountiful, uh, you know, he killed four people that they know of. And uh, the night that he got Debbie Kent, of course, and I'm sure you, that you're familiar with this story, he had attempted to get Carol DeRanche to abduct her from a mall in right. uh, Murray, Utah. And, of course, he caught her in the car, drove through a neighborhood, and stopped the vehicle at the McMillan School, and he attacked her. Well, she fought Bundy really, really hard. She really fought back, and he did something that had never happened before. He lost control of what was going on, and she got out of the car, and he jumped out over his uh, over her passenger seat, tried to chase her, but there were these lights coming down the road, and that was... Uh, I think it's a Wilbur and Mary Walsh, the, this older couple, and they picked her up, and he said, well, you know, that's it. Got in his car. He was in that altered state of his. He needed that kill, and he had been to Bountiful a couple weeks earlier. Picked up a brochure about this play at the Beaumont High School uh, at the Bountiful Recreation Center. So he gets on I-15, shoots, shoots up, up to Bountiful. Check this out. He goes in, and, of course, there's pictures in my book. I've... I, toured and uh, you know photographed this uh, you know high school he goes into uh, uh, he goes in the front doors of this high school it's teeming with people anybody could have been there from Salt Lake it's a 15 minute drive you know and right. anybody could, could have seen him he's scouting for women okay so finally he goes into the uh, theater and the number of people there that night were 1500 people like I say in my book he he exposed himself to hundreds of of them to abduct one of them, and and the only thing he did to conceal his identity, which was almost ludicrous, was he just had a mustache. He he was wearing a fake mustache, oh, and yeah. he had changed his clothes from what he did in the Carol DeRoss thing. But it, but to think of that, he's putting himself in the middle of all of these people in a well lighted hallway and theater because the show hadn't started, and he followed uh, Debbie Ken out. And he got her. So these these are the odd things that Theodore Bundy would do. He's act he's so, acting uh, like a he's acting like a desperate thief uh, that that <laughs> that needs to rob a bank for for some heroin or something. You know, it really is unusual that a man acts yeah. that desperate. Like you say, fifteen minutes later, he's without any uh, disguise whatsoever in the front of people in broad daylight. He's looking for another yeah. victim and gets another victim. Yes, and, and the, the sad thing is, it worked. See, this is the thing about Bundy. I think he, dever- he developed an arrogance. I, f- I really believe he felt like he was untouchable. I mean, if, if we didn't know the story of Theodore Bundy and somebody was going to write fiction about a guy like this who abducts people in front of you know, thousands of, like Sam, he goes into an auditorium to abduct. I mean, it's, it's almost, in my view, it's almost not believable because it's just too risky. But you see... I'm speaking from a normal mind. Most people out there, you know, everybody, normal mind, it just doesn't compute. But to a psychopath like Bundy, and a successful one at that, it seemed like the perfect thing to do. And so well, he has some. Over, he, would, yeah. he has he has some ruses though that are quite clever. The 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 uh, uh, the, the Carol the the ranch. He he poses as a, a police officer and he has his handcuffs. 
Other times he's posing with a cast or that he needs yeah. help. And the thing, what I always yeah. thought, there are some photos too, and maybe it's just me, but he really does look like Greg Kinnear. I don't know well, if you know who Greg Kinnear is. Yes, yeah, know. but he but he looks like that kind of wholesome all American actor, oh, sure. you know. So it must really help. And in many, oh, if you look at yeah. a lot of the women, not to say that most women aren't pretty anyway, but. I mean, he has, he has, uh, uh, his victims were especially attractive women that he targeted these women. Uh, Many people said he targeted women that looked like his first girlfriend that rejected him, so it's uh, Mm -hmm. it's incredible. Well, that's true, and in fact, some some people find a link between that. Uh, Of course, it it is my belief that if Diane Edwards would have never dumped him, and he, let's say he would have even married her, I still believe he would have gone on to kill women because he had such a fantasy world going on that no one knew about where it had to do with violence against women. And like, for instance, just prior to 1974, his sexual desires uh, and um, those things changed. And he was wanting Liz to do things that Liz didn't consider normal. And this was a change. She noticed this. And what, like what? She'd go what? Off well, for, for instance, she, uh, he was wanting anal sex. She didn't want to do that, uh, and she didn't. Uh, and he, she said that was new. This came out in a report. Uh, Jerry Thompson interviewed her, and uh, Detective Valentine and uh, 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 Detective Ira Beale, they all flew up to um, uh, Seattle to see her. And later she was sorry about you know, saying all this because she had her back and forth about Ted. But uh, also, he was wanting to tie her up, and, and, and she did allow that a little bit. But she saw his sexual desires changing. But it's like I have said before, if Liz would have complied with everything, it still wouldn't have been enough because it had to include violence and it had to ultimately include oh, sure. murder. Certainly, yeah. certainly. So, so it didn't matter exactly. So it, I, even if he would have married Diane Edwards, and really Blundy was not going to marry anybody. He knew his life was going to be one of murder and murdering women. So, But even if it, that would happen, he still, I believe, would have become that killer. But there was an arrogance in Bundy, and what's sad is uh, he, he proved over and over again that his bizarre theories of being able to abduct women in broad daylight, or really just about whenever he wanted, uh, turned out to be true. Now, the difference between, let us say, Washington State and Utah, and of course, when he was in Utah, he started killing when the it, the investigation became too hot and heavy in Utah. By January, he was killing in Colorado. And, and he also spent more time in class in, in that second semester. And then he killed in Idaho. But, but by the time he got to Florida, uh, his killing was, of course, where at one time he was real concerned about evidence. By the time he got to Florida, and this is part of his meltdown, he was leaving evidence everywhere. It just didn't matter. Uh, it was just a, it, you know, of course that's before a lot of, you know, uh, DNA, so it wasn't easy to catch a killer that way. But, but he left evidence behind to where once he was caught, uh, it was easy to um, match up a great deal of, uh, you know, evidence against him. But, 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 but Bundy was proven correct so many times on his theory of being able to uh, abduct at will. But like I say, he was uh, articulate, handsome, he was all those things, and he was like a magnet to women. But in Florida, he actually repelled women. He tried to pick up women at um, the disco just across the street it, it's on the same side of, of uh, Kyle Omega. It's gone now. Sh- uh, Sherrod's or uh, Sherrod's. But instead of like being in Washington State where women would sit down and talk to him and think, oh, he's such a good-looking guy. He's nice. Sure, I can go to this car with him. They, they were weirded out by this guy. They were repulsed by this guy. It's like he was putting on vibes. He was a totally different creature by then. And so his days of abducting openly were uh, just about over. And it's like I say in the book. He couldn't coax conscious women to leave with him right. on the night of the Kyle Omega murder, so he attacked unconscious women. That's how sure. far he had descended. He was a very strange char- uh, you know, you know, character. In the annals of, like I said in the book, predatory murder, 
Bundy made, uh, you know, he was like making headlines. Sure. And, and he knew it. He's a very, very unique killer. Bob Keppel said there's just nobody out there like him. Uh, he's just so different. He's just a very odd man. What was what was the for people that don't know? And I mean, the, a lot of people know that he he beat people with crowbars and baseball bats. But there there was talk of necrophilia and there was talk of trophies. Give us the full extent of not the methodology, the actual signature okay. of Ted Bundy. Okay, the main thing that Bundy enjoyed was um, he. Uh, his taste changed. He was definitely in the necrophilia. Uh, he told uh, William Hagmeyer, and he probably told Bob Keppel later, he said he's had as many as four heads in his apartment in Washington State when he lived at the Rogers house, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, like uh, place where all the people... Yes, yes, so thank you. The rooming out, my mind went blank. Uh, <laughs> yes, as many as four heads. Now, it's my opinion, he used those four heads for sexual purposes because uh, uh, Bundy was in, in the necrophilia. He told Bob Keppel that. Um, he kicked it up a notch when he got to Utah, and uh, this is what I mean. There is evidence to suggest, and I mean strong evidence, that he kept both uh, Debbie, uh, or I should say Melissa Smith, and Laura Ann Amy alive. And, and no doubt in his rooming house, probably carried them up the fire escape. And the reason why I say this, and it's been touched upon in other books, and I bring it out in my book, is that when the body of Melissa Smith was viewed, they calculated how long she had been dead, and it was like, you know, five days, but if you double that, you know, whatever. And I, I break this down in the book. It means that she was kept alive for some time, a number of days before she was actually killed. And she was also uh, washed up. Her hair was washed. Her sister said when she was shown the body, she was wearing makeup that she did not own. So Bundy probably, you know, cleaned her and washed her hair and, you know, put on lipstick and did all that stuff and then finally released her into the wilds for, you know, natural decay. But uh, but he kicked it up a notch and very, very brazen. So there's a good chance that uh, – and, and, and Bundy would – the main way that Bundy would take control when he was going to use a crowbar is just to smash him in the head. Now, it usually didn't kill him. He didn't even want them to die because Bill Hagmar himself told me that Bundy used to enjoy knocking them out and then having sex with them, perhaps anal, perhaps, you know, uh, vaginal, from behind, and he choked them to death while he did this. And, of course, that is for physiological reasons of the tightening of the muscles, so on and so forth. So uh, he, he enjoyed that a lot. And Now, here's something interesting that I found out. Uh, of course, Bill Hagmar sat in every confession that Bundy made at the end, every single one of them. And he, you know, some people criticize Hagmar, and I, it's so stupid that they've done so. But they criticized him at the time for getting so close to Bundy and, like, befriending him. But right. here you got a serial killer, and you got a guy who works with the behavioral science unit. Of course, he's seeking information about the killer. Ted got to like him, and of course, they became friends. He befriended Ted, and Ted, Ted warmed up to him. So he wanted to confess everything to Hagmar. Hagmar said, you need to tell all the detectives from all these states, but I'll sit in here with you. Well, I, I, I got a call one day, or I called this particular detective, and we were talking about the girl named uh, Lynette Culver. And Mike Fisher said, well, you know, I talked to Russ uh, Renault, who was the chief investigator out of Idaho at the time, who did the confessions with Bundy. And Renault told me that Bundy got her and that he drowned her in the bathtub. And, um, uh, and that was the manner of death. He, you know, he, that, uh, that he did that. So, Right. 
I called Hagmar. I thought, well, Hagmar can give me the skinny on it. Well, Hagmar didn't even, uh, well, he said, look, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for the, the, the detective that told you that, but I sat in on that confession, and that wasn't uh, mentioned. Well, I had to call Russ Renault. Russ said, well, here's why Bill didn't know it. Oh, and, and it was at that time Bill said, because you know Ted's preferred method of, of the murder was to choke from behind while he's having intercourse with him. You know, and I said, sure, I know that. Well, I talked to Russ. He said, well, here's what happened. He said, we had only an hour. We were covering two cases. But he was making confessions about the hitchhiker that he kidnapped and murdered on September 7th. I mean, uh, September 2nd of 1974 on his way to Salt Lake City. Well, and then we talked about the left, the deal of that Comer girl. So it was, he said we were going back and forth quickly. Well, and he had mentioned that he had put the girl in, that the manner of death was drowning, and that he had put the girl in, or her body in, to, to a river uh, after he left the Holiday Inn. But he never said he drowned in the tub. So as Renault was leaving the prison, he said to Randy Everett, uh, he said, Randy, Bundy never told us really what he did or how he did it. I went to go back in the prison and see if you could get a meeting with him. So Everett did. When Everett was taken into a room and, and, he waited on Bundy about 20 minutes, and he brought Ted in. Ted sat down. He asked him the questions. He said, uh, you know, like you didn't make it clear, how, you know, how did you kill this girl? He said, well, I drowned her in the bathtub. And I took the body, put her in the car, a trunk, and I dumped her in the, uh, I think it was the Snake River. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back. I don't even know if I named the river in the book. Maybe I do. Anyway, but <clears throat> so anyway. Yeah. So, so, so Hagmar told me, he said, well, if you, if you can find out about this, because that, that, that was never said in my presence, I would like to know. Now, Bill Hagmar is an expert. He knows everything about this guy. Here I'm finding something out that even he didn't know. So I right. talked to him and said, yes, well, this is said. He said, well, Randy, you know, had to go back to the prison. He said, well, I can't confirm that. I said, Bill, I understand because you weren't part of it. Everett wasn't, I mean, uh, when Everett went back and met Bundy, uh, Hagmar wasn't there. He was already gone. Bundy's attorney wasn't there. It was just between Randy Everett and Bundy. So, 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 see, that's another thing I brought to light. Plus, I got all the case file information on this girl. I found out uh, numerous things about how that's what was going on in the city there uh, during the time it was, uh, you know, May 6th, but they were having snow showers both both nights that he was there, which would make hunting for Bundy very difficult. Uh, women were scurrying to their cars. Uh, Bundy talked about going into a high-rise of the college uh, and being uh, confronted by a male in, in a woman's dormitory. He was almost detained there, but he was just told to leave. Uh, so I bring out a lot about this Culver girl, where she lived in relation to the school where Bundy got her, the, the, the distance between the Holiday Inn where he took her. So it, where most books, as I say, will have you know maybe several sentences on the Lynette Culver kidnapping and murder, I have about four pages in my book. It's pretty detailed information. And, of course, that's a first. And so I, have, I also had new information about the Julie Cunningham murder that Mike Fisher told me and, uh, and uh, a confession, of, uh, just a, something that Mike Fisher told me about what Bundy confessed to him about killing Karen Campbell, which also has not been in print before. So right. I, I was able to get a lot of new information about, the, uh, about three or four of the murders and a lot of new information about the case in general. So it was a real eye-opener doing the book. And like I say, I had no idea when I started it where it was going to go. I just knew I wanted to do the book. And about halfway through, I thought, man, I have really got something really, really important on my hands here. And I'm so surprised myself because right. this is not a new case, as we all know. So sure. Anyway, it, it, it has been a real experience. And, uh, you know, I was glad to kind of shut the door on on Bundy after I was done with the book, but you know what? I, I still answer a lot of questions at, at a site on Executed Today, where they interviewed me uh, in January 24th of 2009 on the anniversary of Bundy's execution, uh, the 20th anniversary, and uh, we've been I've been answering questions there about the case ever since then. And uh, so pe people are very interested in that case. I think the reason for that, that despite all the new stuff I found out, there's so much about this guy that we still don't know. There's unanswered sure. questions about certain murders, uh, how many murders. I think he probably killed upwards of 40, maybe not that many. 
Uh, he may have killed more young girls. The, uh, Lynette Culver was 12 years old, and you know he feigned ignorance as to her age. He didn't mind being known as a killer of women, but he hated the fact that people would judge him by killing young girls. And his his last murder was of, of Kimberly Leach in Florida, and she was 12. And that's something he couldn't even hardly talk about, except he admitted to. So, right. But uh, he probably killed upwards of maybe 36, 40 people. I mean, it's just no way of no, I would say 36 would probably be a really good estimate. Let me let me ask you a question that uh, that's um, I've wanted to ask since the beginning of the show. When you talked about it was very interesting when you talk about how you got involved in this case and you talked about a guy named uh-huh. James Nancy or James N- Jim N- Yancey, I'm not quite sure, and no, Jerry I, Thompson. Uh, yeah, James Massey. Massey. Yeah, James oh. Massey out of Louisville and Jerry Thompson. Right now, Boston. Jerry yeah. now Jerry Thompson, you were saying that. He got a hold of you, and and between these two guys, you you, you had a meeting, and and you got a you saw Ted Bundy's murder kit, the black bag. Yeah. Now, why on earth did yeah. Jerry Thompson have it? Why did he want to show it to you? How did that all go down? We've got about three minutes left, but tell okay. us how that how you came to be, and what was in that murder kit as well. Okay, it wasn't anything to do with me. Uh, Jim had always expressed a desire to see it. Uh, when Bundy was transferred, he had a fifteen year prison sentence to serve out. For the, for the attempted abduction of Carol Ranch. He was transferred to Colorado, had two escapes, went to Florida, killed. Once he was executed, that was just property in the, in the Utah uh, Sheriff's uh, you know, office. And so right. Gary Thompson took possession of it uh, as teaching tools for seminars. Well, Jim Massey had always wanted to see the bag and, and its contents. What was in there, and I've got pictures of this in the book. i got pictures from the 1975 arrest of all this stuff laid out, and I took pictures and of, of all the stuff at, at you know my home. but um, So he brought it to Louisville to really show Jim. But when Jim asked me to have dinner, here I learned about all this stuff. Jim didn't know the bag was coming to Louisville. He just knew Jerry and his wife were coming to Louisville. Wow. So uh, anyway, so I thought, God, that is weird. And I said, I'd love to see that stuff just because it's so odd. It's like somebody saying Jack the Ripper stuff is here. Let's go look sure. at it. It's yeah, almost like you know, some kind of detachment from it. But that's how that happened. If it wouldn't be for the connection of Jim Massey and Jerry Thompson and, and that, that bag coming to Louisville, I would never have written about this case. It was so odd. But inside the bag, it, it was a ski mask. And then there was a, an ice pick, two right-handed gloves. That's for dragging bodies through the woods. They were only right-handed. One was a, a puffy ski-type glove, and the other was a brown woolen glove with, like, leather on it. Uh, there was a rope for binding hands and feet or choking. Uh, there was a, an electrical cord that was definitely used for choking. There was, uh, there, there were, there was a, a, a bundy had taken a bed, a bed sheet, cut it up into strips for the binding of hands and feet. Those still had the FBI tags on it. And let's see, what else was in the bag? There were the glad bags. Uh, there was a flashlight. And uh, I don't know, but there's a picture of all this stuff on the dining room table. Uh, uh, in my book, and like I say, there's a picture of the, there's a pretty famous picture. In fact, if you go to the site executed today, uh, there will be a little thing on there on the first page, say, join the conversation with Kevin Sullivan, author of the Bundy murders or something like that. If you click on that, you can go to a story and you can see both pictures. But uh, it was just absolutely surreal. And, and like I say, sure. meeting Thompson would have been great, and that might have turned into a snitch article. I guarantee you, without having that stuff in my hands and and being given that bag, I, I don't think I would have been driven to write a book about this guy. Just to be honest, but thank God I was because uh, I think once it was done, it was, I thought, well, this is a, if I, if I could say so myself, a great book. <laughs> yeah, yes, but, it uh, is. It, but anyway. It, and you've done a great service, too, because there's a lot of people, like you say, there's a lot of people that are very interested in this. There are other uh, potential victims, certainly. People, that's a, yeah. that's a, everybody's in agreement. And and yeah. there is a fascination with Ted Bundy because he's all those things that fictional psychopathic killers have the the charm yeah. the the education the good looks yeah. and the beautiful yeah. victims and uh, incredible and then the escape it's you know it's a fascinating yeah. story and and um, uh, and you have just added to the the incredible myth of Ted Bundy and uh, but cut through it with some real good hard facts about some new material so. I want to thank you very much, uh, Kevin Sullivan, for a great interview and for thank your you book, Kevin. The Bundy Murders, Kevin Sullivan. Thank you very, very much, and have a great evening, Kevin. All right. We'll see you later. Thanks, Dan. Thank Bye-bye. you, Kevin. 
Bye-bye. You've been listening to the program True Murder, the most shocking killers in true crime history, and the authors that have written about them, with my guest Kevin Sullivan, The Bundy Murders. Have yourself a good evening. Good night.